Welcome to the 2024 series of the Property Report Podcast by Property Guru. Throughout this series, we will investigate the newest trends in the real estate sector, examining different Asian markets. Now, this special episode is brought to you by HLB, the official supervisor of the Property Guru Asia Property Awards and the official balloting partner of the Property Guru Thailand Property Awards for the People's Choice Awards. In today's discussion, we have a crucial topic lined up as we explore how urban cities maintain its resilience with the impact of climate change more apparent than ever. Now, to enlighten us on how the real estate industry is doing their part, it is with great pleasure that we have with us the highly respected judges of the Property Guru Asia Property Awards series. Let's start with Mr. C.P. Leong, advisor, Mentabelb Limited, Thailand and member, judging panel, Property Guru Thailand Property Awards. We also have Stephen Ohm, director, Quantum Analysis, Singapore, and member, judging panel, Property Guru Asia Property Awards, Middle East. Great seeing you both, gentlemen, to begin this discussion. How would you define a resilient city in the context of the region? And why is it essential to focus on this aspect of urban development? Okay, well, I think resilience uh, in cities basically means a city that is planned to be able to take on uh, potential disasters and at the same time still continue to function properly. I mean, uh, that's how I see it. But uh, uh, And of course, for cities, there are always various sorts of uh, disasters that can be that can come out. You know, like disease outbreaks, uh, climate. You know, things like typhoons, floods, the weather, natural disasters, even political or, or, or terrorist stuff, or even uh, or disease outbreaks like like you know COVID or, or you know uh, uh, malaria stuff like that. But I, I would answer that the. That's how I would define a resilient city, a city that's capable of withstanding all this unexpected or unforeseen stuff and still be able to continue uh, and function properly. CP, I, I, t- I totally agree with you. The Asia region uh, is certainly becoming, if it hasn't already been for some time, uh, the, the new epicenter of the world. And uh, resilience has got so many forms now. If there's the environmental, as you said, in relation to weather and climate change and the typhoon that happened in uh, the Philippines and the weather that's coming to Hong Kong and other places in Asia. Uh, the, the, the climate change is real. We know that it's happening. We know why it's happening, etc. And so the resilience from those perspectives is really important. But resilience has now taken on so many more dimensions, as you said, CP, in relation to COVID, of course, was just a very, very clear example of the need for resilience and that we weren't resilient. Uh, We had plans, but we weren't actually there. We weren't where we needed to be. We knew the pandemic was coming. In some respects, we could have expected a pandemic uh, uh, viral or bacterial to have happened years or decades ago. It wasn't unexpected. Uh, We know that the our world is now such a small place where we're traveling, we're so much more connected than we've ever been before, and that we weren't prepared correctly, i.e. we were not resilient. And it goes into so many more areas, as you said, CP, in relation to healthcare and how we look after our population, how we make sure that they're in a healthy environment. You know, of course, in Asia, the, the 2.5 pollution control is a huge issue uh, from every aspect, including people's health. You know, very unfortunately, our healthcare systems have gotten a lot better, our medicines and treatment programs a lot better, but the percentage of people, uh, unfortunately, uh, having serious disease such as cancer is on the rise. And that has a lot of environmental factors and also other factors associated with the resilience of cities. You know, is it too far to say that cities that concentrate on fast food, et cetera, rather than having logistics and being able to provide healthy food is a direct cause of a decline in health standards in various places? I say yes. Currently, I'm in the Middle East, and unfortunately, the levels of diabetes are astronomical in the Middle East, as they are in 
the Western world, America, Europe, uh, and many other places around the world. So resilience has now got so many more dimensions uh, and the response of the real estate sector to all of those dimensions is is not only huge, but it's absolutely essential. Interesting what you just said there, Stephen. What are some of the key challenges that the cities face concerning climate change and natural disasters? In relation to climate change, there is all of the issues uh, associated with climate change. You know, our, our carbon footprint, uh, our methane emissions, and all of the other uh, emissions, our use of energy, and all of those types of things. Those are real challenges. They have been laid out before us and well defined for decades. Last year, for example, I, w- I was um, heavily involved with COP28 uh, in the United Arab Emirates, and Of course, you know, the whole world, all of the government leaders, all of our industry leaders, uh, all of our populations are all very much aware of some of the key issues associated with energy and power in relation to water, in relation to the general environment outside our buildings and within our buildings, uh, our, um, our use of materials, our management of waste, all of these issues. All of those core issues are still on the table. And whilst a lot of our uh, governments and our industry leaders are focused on these issues, uh, many are not as focused on them as much as they could be. And also the outcomes are not necessarily as high uh, or as appropriate as they should be. And that is a key challenge, but it's also really a key opportunity for the whole industry, country by country, city by city, company by company, et cetera. I agree with what Stephen is saying, but I think primarily uh, um, most Asian cities, may, maybe except for Singapore, which is uh, much more neatly planned, uh, would be, I think, uh, the governments and, and the authorities need to uh, look more d- deeply into it because, you know, it's like inadequate building codes, city planning, and especially some of the older cities, uh, which uh, you know uh, the infrastructures have been have been around for years. So there are a lot of challenges uh, in that sense. That uh, it's not only affecting the the developers. I think it affects it affects the whole whole city as a whole. You know, um, it's challenging. But I think, uh, like, like uh, for example, I, I would look at uh, Bangkok, where I'm based. Um, the usual challenges here is always flooding sea level rise because it's a sinking city you know and uh, um, and also air pollution air, air, like you mentioned earlier air, everybody is looking at the 2.5 pollution things and it, it occurs year after year um, but uh, it's really it's uh, easier said than done in terms of addressing it uh, nationally because uh, some of this stuff like, like the pollutions no doubt primarily it is caused by maybe vehicular transports or, 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 or industries, you know. But partly it's also because, you know, that uh, we all know that there's this annual drift of uh, crop burning stuff, you know, that, that will flow through the whole of Southeast Asia that affects uh, everybody, uh, every country, in, in fact. And, and those are the stuff that may, maybe in terms of government uh, 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 of each country, they it's beyond their control because it comes in from somewhere else. So... Maybe uh, um, I would think that uh, the authority may have to look at alternative ways to to solve or, or, or at least to mitigate all these this issues uh, indirectly. I, I guess maybe, you know, like uh, since you can't prevent it, how do we address it? CP, absolutely. I um, fully, agree, fully agree with you. And I think that that, that bridge between... Uh, government and civil society and then between the industry developers and designers etc that 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 bridge needs to be stronger and needs to be better used and really bringing the parties together um, not only as you said not only within the country so within the government and the NGOs uh, and the companies and designers within a particular city but also in between countries in the region having those that link up is really, really important. Of course, that's one of the things that we're always striving to achieve at the Asia Real Estate Summit, and we'll be doing it again this year in December, 
is really to bring people together so that there there can be a linked up in thinking, so that there can be stronger outcomes in relation to step by step progress for all of the issues that we've mentioned. How are real estate developers and urban planners integrating resilient measures into their projects to address climate related risks? I think it's moved from not being aware of the issues to not being aware of what the options are to now uh, the enlightened real estate developers, uh, the, the urban planners and all of the design teams and all of the industry professionals are really starting to realise that addressing the issues contributing to climate change are really excellent opportunities sometimes to save money, of often sustainability and addressing climate change is, is thought of as an additional cost. But very often when people are approaching this uh, optimally, they're actually finding that they can save capital costs, which is great, but also that the marketing of developments and projects generally, it's no longer just a matter of presenting some nice pictures and that type of iconography for developments, but now it's to really include um, sustainability design features and outcomes and measure those, be it under the, the local national rating schemes for buildings or under uh, other rating tools and certifications or via specific initiatives, uh, which they uh, include in their promotional materials. Uh, and instead of being words and very nice presentations, there's now some real substance behind it. And that's very uh, interesting and um, excellent to see because the industry really is starting to address that more and more. Unfortunately, not everyone uh, and not everyone to the same degree. Some are leaders uh, and, and some are in the middle and some are still not where they need to be. Uh, but definitely the industry is very, very much on the move in the right direction. Yeah, you're right, Stephen. Um, but I, I think to address, let's say, integrating resilience into into projects, I, I would say it has to first begin uh, with the project itself. Um, like to address it, uh, we have to look at look at the, the the planners and the developers. Are they willing to to uh, integrate all these new measures? Would be to me beginning straight away is the actual construction itself. You know, uh, are, are they going for green buildings uh, or, you know, low or zero carbon uh, sort of uh, design? Are, are they having uh, cooling met cooling uh, uh, systems like air conditioning and all that that is uh, not so, uh, uh, would, would not cause actually a, a, heat, a heat zone you know, in the city centers? Are they having enough green areas? Uh, do they address the... Flooding issues, you know, that, that uh, that's common in in Bangkok, for example. You know, uh, uh, every time it rains, you know, it floods. Um, so all, all those things to me it has to has to go into the project at the planning as well as the construction stage. Um, and also, in fact, uh, now people are progressing towards even green methodology of construction and equipment, uh, in the sense that they decide they would decide to use uh, equipment that are less uh, polluting. Uh, uh, you know, uh, um, e e machines, cranes, uh, stuff like that for construction, and even uh, 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 less polluting uh, materials uh, in the construction itself. And I can I can think of, for example, uh, the current uh, big project in Bangkok, which is called One Bangkok. I think it it, it must be about fourteen towers and about three or four. Uh, hotels into it's like a mini city in that if i am not wrong i think they they they, they even a plan for um recycling of the water use in the site uh for during construction so to me this is one of the samples of how uh, a developer would would look at in the uh, bringing uh, uh addressing all this uh, uh, resilience and and uh, creating a, a good project that is more up-to-date in terms of well, addressing all these climate changes and all that. 
Now for the final question, gentlemen, looking ahead, what are some of the biggest opportunities and challenges in promoting resilience in city's real estate markets? Well, primarily, I think it is always the good and the bad. The good is that the uh, you know uh, we we can uh, tell the clients or the customers who are buying all these properties that oh you know you are living in a green building you know everything is good and fine it's healthy it's a healthier living you know it's a better livability factor if you are moving into a uh, let's say an apartment that is uh, green and uh, and uh, well up to date in in all these uh, addressments. Um, also, it's uh, it's good for the community areas as well as even the whole city if everybody is adopting it. Um, the challenges to me is that one, putting all this stuff in, uh, it has one main challenge and that is cost. Okay, um, as we all know, uh, implementing all this new stuff uh, would actually incur an additional cost to, as compared to traditional uh, constructions. So um, the developers would have to actually balance between, you know, cost increase as against uh, uh, how well you can sell your property uh, with the attraction that it is actually a, a better livable uh, product uh, as compared to, let's say, traditional constructions. Of course, the the livability factor uh, varies depending on on the the market sector you're addressing. You know, uh, uh, if you're looking at let's say low cost housing and, and stuff like that, then obviously you can't really sell much of this. But if you're looking at maybe let's say uh, high end uh, condominiums and stuff like that, I I would think that the it is much more workable than than uh, I I don't think it will be easy to address the whole city as a whole. I think it all depends on the, the type of development one is going after. CP, I, I think what you said and how you started that in relation to the good and bad, you know, that very sort of black and white picture, I think is the right picture to paint because in Asian cities, in actual fact, in all cities around the world uh, and the, the, the population um, demographics uh, and the people movements, between cities in all places throughout Europe and throughout the whole world, and especially in Asia, is so much more dynamic than it's ever been in the past. And I think for you to relate it from individual buildings to overall communities and that sort of livability, et cetera, is exactly correct. And that's how, that's exactly how resilience is going to be measured in the future. Uh, if, uh, for example, you're um, currently in Bangkok and uh, Bangkok has had a, uh, a huge uh, dynamic changes in the last decade. A lot of people are um, flocking to Bangkok because of what it offers in, in various aspects. And one of the big factors there is livability at all ends of the spectrum from people working um, and coming there for working, but they're not um, high on the uh, income spectrum uh, to very, very affluent individuals and business uh, people. Um, and... Bangkok has and is striving to attract all of those people. Currently, I'm in Dubai and it's exactly the same situation. We have people here that are earning less than a thousand dollars a month and other individuals that are earning millions a year. And this city is trying to cater for all of them and is being successful. Of course, Singapore has been another um, city that has done that very successfully on a global scale. Resilience is responding to all of these factors and to all of the um, socioeconomic, etc., cetera, uh, populations because the cities that don't address the issues of uh, climate change and livability um, and uh, in Dubai, they even have a lot of the centres. They're called happiness centres. You go to a police station and it's a happiness centre. You go to the roads and transit authority and where the customers go is a happiness centre. And they're very focused on sort of saying, we want to make sure that you're happy with every single step of your journey uh, in being part of our community and our city. Uh, the, the happiness is not necessarily used in all of the cities around, um, the, uh, around the world and around the region. But, you know, it's very clear that a lot of Asian cities are very welcoming uh, and have very, very high hospitality um, 
Sometimes that's being promoted and strengthened in very proactive ways, and sometimes it's happening by default, and sometimes maybe some cities are losing that. Uh, it does, if, if governments, as CP said, really address and promote this, championing developers and designers building by building, they will build communities, they will build a stronger ethos for resilience within their communities, and that they will attract not thousands, not tens of thousands, but multiples of that to their cities. Conversely, the cities that don't address those issues, they will slowly but surely, hundreds a week, thousands a month, and tens of thousands or more, will slowly leave and the brain drain, the skills drain, etc., will all happen. And along with that, all of the issues associated with taxation, income, uh, national debts, all of those issues uh, will uh, follow. So what we're discussing here and the built environment that we create is the very first steps, but the very important foundational steps for making sure that cities are, really are resilient. Well, I must add, uh, uh, Stephen said that link. Let's, let's put a bit of reality into all this. Uh, uh, of course, what we all think of ideally is nice, but the, the fact remains is like, so the more uh, bigger cities and uh, uh, older, bigger cities, say Bangkok, for example, and, uh, and officially we're talking about 10 million, you see, and uh, and because it's been it's been around for so long, uh, uh, with so much of unplanned stuff, it's actually quite challenging for the authority to uh, uh, to to do that. And plus, there's also stuff like uh, uh, unplanned settlements. I mean, to call it the uh, crudely, maybe the squatters. You know, uh, they start building uh, 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 illegally everywhere. I mean, you can see in you can see in 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 Bangkok. You can even see in Manila. You know, um, so as, as I'm thinking that you know, for for the authorities to look at it, it's not so easy to handle, because uh, on one hand, while you say you can do good for the people, but on the other hand, uh, uh, there are laws that need to be updated, the uh, building planning codes uh, that has to be uh, uh, again revised and updated to to do this. Plus, um, of course, there are good and bad. Now, after, let's say if you do a lot of all these uh, new laws and codes uh, that restricts and call for settlements uh, and and uh, and insist that all the new developers would have to do all this uh, stuff, it, it would put a strain on to the to the private sector, and then it it will be uh, then up to the private sector to be able to sell this uh, to attract people to come. Um, like what you say about you know attracting people, uh, uh, it, a lot of it also depends on the migration of people coming in and out. Uh, it depends on what are we talking about. Bangkok again, for example, its primary uh, uh, influx is really tourists. It, it it is one of the main uh, income earners of Thailand anyway. So there's always a heavy influx of tourists that it comes in, and that that builds up uh, through the years. So. Why do you house them? They are either in hotels, service departments, you know, or or, or stuff like that. So, but at the same time, uh, uh, because of a big influx of uh, people, is your aging and existing infrastructures capable to withstand it? You know, uh, uh, the transport systems, for example, the highways, the public, the public trains, the buses. Of course, uh, uh, I think Bangkok at the moment uh, uh, is handling it quite okay because the, its network of uh, trains, elevated trains and underground systems are, are expanding uh, uh, gradually. Um, it's, uh, it, it is still a challenge. I mean, uh, what, what I'm saying is that, yes, uh, ideally every country would, would like to, to do what we, we, just, we all just said. But uh, I, I, I have to, to point out that uh, it is really challenging for the governments as well uh, because it, it's not that not easy to solve. Sydney, you're, you're absolutely right. It is extremely challenging. I, in relation to governments, though, I mean, there are really good models around where any additional costs for building in resilience or greater sustainability or greater livability can be offset. And, of, of course, a very good example of that is where 
governments and regulatory authorities allow somebody to build a little bit more square feet or square meters if they uh, achieve certain additional uh, benefits. And uh, for, that's been extremely successful in Singapore, for example, where they give it additional GFA if you meet certain requirements, uh, which, which is improving the livability index and improving sustainability. And they do that in a very direct and targeted way so that in actual fact, it doesn't cost the developer or the community any more money because it, the additional cost is more than offset by the additional square meters or square feet that they can sell to the market. And those win-win propositions are there, but are not for a moment taking away your emphasis on the challenges because the challenges are very, very big. But... There are ways of doing it, and, um, and 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 a lot of people are focused on those things, which is really great. Yeah, no, no, I agree with you, but but I, I was just putting on a little bit of a reality check because you know Singapore, for example, is a super efficient smallish population, so it's easy to handle. Uh, as contrast to let's say Hong Kong, which is similarly sized and 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 a little bit more hectic there. But I'm thinking more of other Asian cities uh, besides Bangkok, which is actually quite cosmopolitan. Let's look at the, the other ASEAN countries, for example, you know, Jakarta, for example, Manila. It, I think we all know that these long-established cities are really pretty challenging in terms of infrastructure and people moving around, you know. And not to mention even the less developed ones like, say, Ho Chi Minh or, or in Cambodia or Laos, you know, these, these places. It's, it's a lot more challenging for those countries, that's what I'm trying to say. Because for one, uh, they lack the finance uh, to do it on a government basis. And two, uh, the building codes are probably not up to date yet. And three, I think they lack the, the market size uh, to attract uh, developers on what you mentioned, like in Singapore, where you, you, give, you give and take to, to balance out you know, uh, uh, this sort of thing. It, it, I'm, I'm just saying it's a realistic reality check, really. I mean, I agree with you. If ideally, you know, uh, uh, it's like like in the West, in the Western countries. I mean, there are a lot of incentives for building green, for example. You get all sorts of incentives, but the, in Asia, uh, it is still at this infancy stage for this. Yes, no, absolutely, I I agree. Um, th there are very very significant challenges, but as you said. We know what those challenges are and we know what mechanisms and protocols and processes that we can use to step by step, inch by inch, uh, move those um, items forward to the benefit of those cities and the, and the region overall. CP, Stephen, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us today. And uh, thank you once again to uh, the listeners for listening to this episode of the Property Report podcast by Property Guru. Once again, this special episode is brought to you by HLB, the official supervisor of Property Guru Asia Awards and the official balloting partner of the Property Guru Thailand Property Awards for the People's Choice Awards. Exciting topics await in our upcoming episode, so please make sure to tune in. For additional details, check out asiapropertyawards.com. Once again, that's asiapropertyawards.com. See you next time.